So this is your review for Unit 7, Natural Selection. Remember that natural selection is a mechanism for evolution. So Darwin is known as the father of evolution, but he did not come up with the concept of evolution. He came up with natural selection, which is the mechanism or the how natural selection works. Um, in order for natural selection to occur, you must have the following. One is going to be variation among the populations. Um, so you have to have different traits available. If everybody looks the same, there's not going to be any differential success. You're not going to have strongest and weakest. Um, you can increase variation through mutations, independent assortment, crossing over, or random fertilization. You must also have op overpopulation. There must be too many babies born that can survive. If everybody survives, again, it's not the strongest surviving, just everybody survives. Then you must have competition over a limited number of resources. That way, only the best suited to the environment or the best able to get those resources survive. You must have favorable traits becoming more common over time, which is going to change the allele frequency. And again, evolution, natural selection takes a long, long time, 50 generations at least. An adaptation is a genetic variation that is favored for selection. So it's a trait that has provided an advantage in an environment. So some examples of adaptations would be giraffe's long necks, um, fur color, uh, fur type, so like a, a polar bear has white fur to blend into the snow, has a lot of fat in order to survive the cold. So any of those traits that help an animal survive is called an adaptation. Fitness or evolutionary fitness is the ability to survive and reproduce in an environment. It should be different for different animals. So some animals should have what we call high fitness or good survival rates or low fitness or low survival. So again, with natural selection, it's only the strongest are going to survive. So these are those four requirements, again, just in picture form. So you must have variation. You must have different colors or traits in the population. You must have an overproduction of offspring, which leads to competition, which is going to lead to only the strongest surviving. Adaptations are then going to result, which make certain organisms better, better able to survive. And then you'll get selection where those traits are selected for or picked by the environment. One example of natural selection that we've seen actually in real time is the peppered moth. So you can find lots of videos of the peppered moth. Um, essentially, they lived in Europe and they live with these birch trees um, that have, you know, the white bark. So there was two types. There was a peppery type that was more white and then the, the darker type. And initially, pre-industrial revolution, the white one was better suited to the environment because it could hide. So you see that at the beginning, the white moth population or allele was much higher. Then the Industrial Revolution happened. We had a lot of coal and ash produced, covered the trees, which changed the trees to black. And we witnessed over time that then the black moth became better survived, uh, better able to survival. And its population went up, or its allele frequency went up, and the white went down. Um, actually, the reverse happened again because we kind of realized we need to not pollute. And now, you know, it has stabilized. So there are different types of selection, different types of natural selection that occur among animals. Um, the, they're written here. So we have the big three is stabilizing, disruptive, or directional. So stabilizing selection is where the average is selected for, where you get kind of a limiting of the two outliers and get more of just the middle ground. Disruptive would be the extremes are selected for, so very, you know, dark color or light color. This is usually what leads to speciation the quickest. And then directional selection is where you get a whole shift towards one extreme where you're not getting changes in the curve, but it just shifts towards, you know, very dark color, very light color. You can also have sexual selection where the competition for mates more so than the environment is going to drive what's best. So again, we talked about the peacock and the fact that its tail is more for finding mates and survival. And then artificial selection is what humans have done. An example would be the human uh, dog breeds, um, horses, some crops where humans are selecting the best traits. And, and usually with artificial selection, it's not necessarily what's best for the animal. It's kind of what best humans have decided what's best. <clears throat> so remember that AP loves these graphs. It is important for you to know these graphs, um, the stabilizing directional and disruptive selection, not only what's happening, right? So stabilizing is towards the middle, directional shifting the whole curve, and disruption has that bend in the middle. It's important for you to kind of know an example of each, which are down here. Right? And then um, what the curves look like and how they change. It's very likely you will see these graphs on the test. 
We do have evidence for evolution. Again, it's a scientific theory. It's not a regular theory. There's evidence backing it. Um, <clears throat> one of those evidences is fossils. So we know that we can collect fossils in prints of organisms. We can figure out how old they are, and then we can put these fossils in order, and that shows us change over time. It allows us to make phylogenetic trees, which is showing us how organisms have evolved. So we can see older examples of organisms to newer and see the slight changes that were made. <clears throat> Morphological homologies or homologous analogous structures, vestigial structures show common ancestry. Um, so things that we used to have, like we used to have a tail, so we have remnants of a tailbone, show us how we have changed over time. And then the big one is that biochemical genetic similarity, the fact that we all have the same DNA, nucleotides, and protein sequences, which give rise to the idea that we all had a common ancestor. Um, genetic variation or different traits in a population are necessary for evolution. Um, if you have no genetic variation, there is no change that can happen. The, the organism cannot respond to a changing environment. Um, you don't have better or worse or stronger fitness or less fitness. You just have one thing and that can actually um, increase the ris risk of extinction if you don't have a lot of genetic variation. Um, genetic variation in a population comes from mutations, crossing over events, so mixing up of the, the chromosomes, the idea that the chromosomes independently assort so you can get any trait from mom and dad at any time and random fertilization. So again, mutations here are going to be any small changes in the DNA. Um, some mutations are bad, some are good, some are kind of you don't notice. So when you have a good quote unquote mutation that provides an advantage, that's how we get variation and, and evolution from that. Crossing over is mixing up of the chromosomes again before they split. Um, and then the idea that you can have any sperm and any egg combined that can be carrying any combination of traits. This is why humans, pretty much humans don't look exactly alike because we have all this random um, genetic variation. So Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is going to talk about whether or not a population is evolving. You can use Hardy-Weinberg to decide, is this population evolving? If a population is at equilibrium, we say it's not evolving or it's stable. And, and that's fine, that happens. Um, in order to look at whether or not a population's to evolving to kind of decide, you must have no natural selection occurring. So that could be there's more than enough resources to go around, there's not enough, um, you know, there's not an overpopulation of offspring. <clears throat> you must have no mutations. That's probably the hardest one because there's always mutations. So you might want to add the word meaningful mutation. So if you have a mutation that just disappears, that doesn't really count. No migration, so no movement into or out of a population because that could introduce new alleles. You must have a very large population size. If you get too small, remember, your genetic variation decreases and that causes issues. And then you must have random non-sexual selection meeting. So basically, no selection happening whatsoever. So if all those conditions are met, we would say a population is currently at equilibrium. It is not evolving. You only need one of these things to be true to decide that a population is evolving. There is some math that can go into Hardy-Weinberg. Again, you're not going to have a ton of Hardy-Weinberg problems, maybe a few here or there. Um, there's two main equations, P plus Q equals 1, and the P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1. What you're looking at is alleles, dominant recessive alleles, and how often or how, um, how common they are in a population. So the P is going to be the dominant allele, the Q is going to be the recessive. PQ is when you have one dominant and one recessive or a heterozygous mix. You generally use the P plus Q for just how it looks. So you see the animals purple or pink. You use this one, the 2P squared one, when you want to look at um, the alleles. So is it dominant where it's two dominants or is it dominant where it's a mixture? Please go ahead and look at the practice problems and the videos for that. So here is one practice problem, okay? Um, you can work through this kind of on your own. You see that you're looking to get an instance of approximate 1 in 90,000. That's going to give you um, the Q because it's recessive. Um, you do not have to solve in this exact way. This is showing you an example problem. Like we usually take the Q squared first, find the Q squared first. On the AP test, there could be one or two of these. You're not going to have a bunch of free responses, a bunch of these. If it's a multiple choice problem, it doesn't even matter that you show your work. You're essentially just going to pick out the answer. So again, go ahead and reference your worksheet um, and the practice problems from the Hardy-Weinberg. So speciation is where two new species arrive from one species. Remember, the kind of defining characteristic of a species is whether or not it can breed together. So if two species can breed together, they are considered the same species. If they can't, they cannot. Um, 
ways that this happens is one is geographic isolation. So they're separated by a physical barrier. They literally can't come in contact. And then we have some reproductive isolations where the animals actually do come in contact or sympatric. They live in the same place. They just can't physically um, procreate. So there could be mating behavior differences, habitat differences. So for example, fish and a bird are never going to come in contact. Um, mating season or time of day and then different anatomical structures. So again, sympatric speciation is where you're going to get speciation occurring with animals living in the same area. That's going to be the key. Sympatric means in the same area. So they live, you know, let's say they both live by this little stream, but some of those other barriers to reproduction are going to keep them different species. Allopatric is basically where there's always some kind of barrier, usually a physical barrier to reproduction, a geographic one. So they could live on different places. There's a mountaintop. There's another, you know, there's two different streams. They just physically don't come into contact. So the different types of evolution are divergent, covergent, and coevolution. So divergent is when a, a species adapt from different environments, different species form. So basically they split, like they diverge in a, in a wood. This is adaptive radiation as well. Convergent is where two species are, are encountering the same. They, they, they don't have relationships where they encounter the same problem and they fix those problems the same. So they kind of come together or converge. And then coevolution is where two species evolve kind of with each other in response to each other. So, for example, a predator-prey relationship, a, a flower-pollinator relationship, they're kind of evolving on the same lines together. So, again, just showing you in picture format, divergent versus convergent. So, we have the common ancestor of the wolf that separated into a fox and a dog. So, divergent means they're separating, and convergent, convergent has this no common ancestor, but they all kind of develop wings on their own to fix a similar problem. This is showing you adaptive or radi uh, adaptive radiation where you had the finch we talked a lot about. Uh, the bird, depending on where it's living and what it's eating, is going to evolve differently and you have a whole bunch of new species forming. And this is an example of coevolution. So you're looking at monarch butterflies evolving with birds. So the monarchs are trying not to get eaten by the birds. They keep trying to evolve to get to to get rid of that. And then the bird's going to find a new way to eat them. So they are kind of evol evolving at the same time. So remember, an analogous an, like anti, like not, is a structure where the structure is different. It evolves separately, but it fixed the same problem. So an example there would be the body shapes of marine animals. So a shark, a penguin, and a dolphin um, live in the same environment. They do not have a common ancestor, but they have similar fin and body structures because they need to swim fast. So that body structure and fin shape, which would be analogous to each other, um, solve the same problem of fin swimming fast, even though it's not really set up the same because they didn't have a common ancestor. And then homologous structure, homo meaning the same, is where you're going to get a similar structure evolved from a common ancestor. So you see here, um, this is the human, cat, whale, and a bat. So you have these limbs, and you can see they all have that upper bone kind of connected to a shoulder joint, the two middle kind of forearm bones, wrist bones, and then digit bones. So these are homologous. They're developing from the same ancestor. We know that Equilibrium can be what we call gradual or gradualism or punctuated. Gradualism is slow, smaller changes over time that are usually more straight lined. Where punctuated, you get quicker kind of incidences of quick evolution and then a lot of like downtime like equilibrium. So gradualism again is going to graphically look like this where one species disappears, a new species takes over. One species disappears, a new species, species takes over. So it's more straight line. Punctuated is the stair step where you get very quick, rapid evolution, and then some, you know, stable, stability. You get some equilibrium. And then you get quick evolution and stability. Um, we're finding more and more we think it's more a punctuated equilibrium situation than the gradual, um, just based on kind of how environments change. So in order to keep two species separate or to create new species, you must have what we call pre- and post-zygotic barriers. Remember, a zygote is that first cell that's formed when a sperm and an egg come together. So prezygotic means before zygote is formed, postzygotic is after it's formed. Um, so a prezygotic or pre-reproductive barrier would be ecological isolation, behavioral isolation, gametic isolation, temporal or mechanical. And postzygotic is where the baby is actually born, but they can't reproduce. So we call that a hybrid animal. So they don't have um, viability, fertility, and they often break down or die kind of earlier than a normal um, animal. So you see here some specific examples with each one in picture form. So again, temporal is time. So if you have two animals that are, you know, one's nocturnal, one's diurnal, 
Uh, one comes out in the spring, one comes out in the fall. They're just physically not going to come in contact. Ecological is different habitats. They just live simply in different places. That could also be geographical. Behavioral is their their techniques of wooing the opposite sex. So the example here is bird songs. It could be, you know, whatever they do to kind of uh, uh, attract a mate doesn't work with the, with the other species. Mechanical is they physically cannot um, copulate. They cannot, the, the pieces don't go together. And then you'll notice with the post-zygotic, it's all about the hybrid basically not being able to reproduce. So you can make a donkey, a mule, you can make a liger, you can make a tigon, they will be born, but they cannot make more of themselves. So if they cannot reproduce on their own, we consider them not a species. So two kind of graphing type things that we did was the phylogenetic tree and the cladogram. They show similar things. They're a little bit different, though. So remember, a phylogenetic tree is going to look like a branching tree where a cladogram is going to kind of be the lines, look kind of on a straight line with like lines, kind of like roads coming off of it. So a phylogenetic tree is going to be branching. Um, the distance is going to tell you how much change has occurred or how closely related they are. A phylogenetic tree does take into account time and is based on morphological characteristics that we see. A cladogram is going to show relatedness as well, but it does not include time. It just kind of shows how, where the common ancestor or the morphological traits exist. So this here is showing you a cladogram. We talked about it a lot. You've, you've made one. So again, this is a cladogram showing you the species and the traits. And remember, the way you look at this is the closer two are on the cladogram, the more closely related they are. So a turtle and a leopard are pretty closely related. A leopard's closer to a turtle than it is a lamprey. And these traits, remember, are kind of the divergent traits where a vertebral column, a lancelet does not have a vertebral column, everyone else does. Lamprey and lancelets don't have a jaw, everyone else does. So that's kind of the feature that separates the species. And this is showing you a phylogenetic tree. You're going to look at the nodes and the branching. Um, still can give you some indication of how closely related they are. There is some time evolved here. So you can see, you know, this is very far back in time and this is more current time. So we've gone over the origins of life before. So this is more of a review of a review. Um, this is how we got life on the planet. The primordial soup hypothesis is the Miller and Urey one, where they tried to replicate conditions of early Earth with the gases and the electricity and the volcanoes and the heat to see if they could make organic molecules from inorganic molecules. It was kind of successful, not super successful. Um, they were able to make some very you know low-level organic molecules, but not everything they needed. And then the RNA world hypothesis is just the idea that very early creatures had RNA instead of DNA because RNA was simpler. And this is showing you the Miller-Urey setup. Again, we talked about this in Unit 1. Um, they were trying to get, you know, they knew these elements existed because that's in volcanic explosions. They had some uh, electricity to show lightning and some water, and they wanted to see if they could make, you know, lipids and carbs and proteins. They didn't make those. They made some building blocks of those. Um, so it was semi-successful, I would say. And then this is just showing you the RNA world where we don't have DNA involved. It's just all RNA to protein simply because RNA is simpler.